everyone please switch off your microphone so figurative language and scheme what is figurative language can anyone answer me what is figurative language so basically figurative language as we call it figures of speech which we used to teach from 6 onwards right so i would like to show you my screen is visible to everyone okay so figurative language is also known as figures of speech right so what is this figurative language so there are almost more than 100 figure of speech okay but in this session we will only come to know the basic figure of speech which we basically used to teach from 6 onwards so let's start the first definition is the figure of speech is a word or phrase that possesses a separate meaning from its literal definition it can be metaphor or simile it designed to make a comparison it can be the repetition of alliteration or the exaggeration of hyperbole to provide a dramatic effect right so what does it mean the opposite of literal language is figurative language okay and figurative language is language that means more than what it says on the surface okay it usually give us a feeling about its subject and poets poets use figurative language almost as frequently as literal language and when you read poetry you must be conscious of the difference otherwise a poem make no sense at all you know so author often use figures of speech in both literature and poetry to enhance their writing right and figure of speech is already present ordinary things in new or unusual way they communicate ideas that go beyond the world's usual literal meaning right so it lend some particular wealth to literature and poetry they also pack a punch in speeches and in movie lines indeed these tools abound in nearly every corner of life right so for example suppose just have a look this is written that a figure of speech is a departure from the ordinary form of expression or the ordinary course of ideas in order to produce a greater effect so whenever we say something but we don't mean it literally we are using figure of speech for example suppose let's say that uh, we are about to head out to the store and our mother says you better take a jacket it's raining cats and dogs out there so does our mom literally means that animals are falling from the sky no so this kind of things this kind of sentence which gives some different sense is figure of speech is a figurative language right so once again let's see what is this figure of speech and a figurative language in the form of single word or phrase it can be a repetition arrangement or omission of words with literal meaning or a phrase with a specialized meaning 
but not based on the literal meaning of the words right but a figure of speech is essentially a word or phrase used in non literal sense for rhetorical or vivid effect they are plainly defined as saying one thing in terms of something else so what does that mean it is simple actually so some objectives by the end of the session we'll see there are 15 i basically want to show you and we will identify some figure of speech in poems okay now this picture is showing the types of figure of speech okay it based on four themes like constructions resemblance association contrast So what is there in construction? In construction, it comes climax, anticlimax. In resemblance, there is simile, metaphor, personification, apostrophe. It when it comes to association, it comes metonymy, and then synodoc. And based on contrast, it is antithesis and epigram. Right. But as I told you, there are more than hundred figures of speech. like for example there is accumulation then it is adventure allegory okay alliteration then amplification anachronism this all are figure of speech but depends on that which class we are teaching which class we used to use this kind of figure of speech there are more figure of speech like you can say uh, biography then it is canon then catastrophe then catharsis character comedy comparatives comparison consonance then you can say like uh, discourse dissonance distortion dramatic irony dramatic monologue so there are num lot of figure of speech but basically the 15 figure of speech which i used to show you today the first one is the very simple the very common that is simile right so what is this simile in a simile it's a comparison which is made between two objects of different kinds which have however one point in common the simile is usually introduced the words as like as a so for example as the heart panted after the water broke so panted my soul after the god so basically simile it is a comparing between two unlike things like or as for example suppose if i tell you she ran like the wind so running and the wind are unlike things okay so when we compare the speed of running to the speed of wind we are using a simile okay let's try to see this in more easiest way it is a comparison of at least one common point between two different object as i told you like or as for example suppose if i will say she is as brave as lion that means she is brave like a lion right she is as beautiful as rose as slippery as an eel fight like a mouse as wise as an owl so see here we are comparing we are comparing the girl with the lion she is as brave as the lion okay so some more example if i'll see the snow was as thick as blanket 
that means we are comparing the snow with blanket she was as light as a feather you are acting like a baby he felt like a bug under a microscope his temper was as explosive as a volcano all this words like volcano like baby feather blanket these all are the comparing words of the subject we are comparing these things with the subject so where we are comparing like by using like or as it's called simile right now let's have a look at this picture my dog is as smelly as dirty socks sounds some comical this pizza is as cold as ice so whenever you see the like the word like or as it comes the poet or the writer use you want to use the word simile right okay now the second topic this is called metaphor and let me tell you all that there is very slight difference between metaphor and simile right because metaphor this is also used for comparison and simile this is also used for comparison this both figure of speech used for comparison but there is some slight difference so let's see what is metaphor a metaphor it is an implied smile simile sorry it does not like the simile state that one thing is like another or act as another but takes that for granted and proceed as if the two things were one in short we can say that metaphor is called as direct comparison right in simile we don't use the direct comparison but in metaphor we use the direct comparison like for an example here it is the camel is a sheep of the desert the camel is a sheep of the desert so we are directly saying this camel that camel is called the sheep of the desert but in case of simile we never used to do the direct comparison right so let's see it in more easiest way the definition of metaphor is similar to the definition of a simile but there is one important difference between this two this is let's see the difference we use the following examples to figure out the definition of metaphor like for example in simile if i say fido is like a teddy bear fido is as soft as a teddy bear in metaphor what we will say fido is a teddy bear so now try to understand this fido is like a teddy bear so here we are comparing comparing fido here we are comparing fido with a teddy bear that fido he is like a teddy bear okay and or we can say fido is as soft as a teddy bear right but when we say in metaphor fido is a teddy bear that means we are directly saying fido as a teddy bear fido is a teddy bear that means fido is directly comparing with the teddy bear another example which we can see that boy is running like a cheetah that boy is as fast as cheetah and in metaphor if we say then it will be that boy is a cheetah so it is very clear in one sentence we are comparing the boy that his running is like a cheetah in simile but when it comes to metaphor we will say that boy is a cheetah that's called direct comparison okay and simile we can say it is indirect comparison right now some more examples are there metaphor it makes a direct comparison between two unlike things or ideas okay she is a lion okay now suppose this example is 
she is a lion if simile in simile what we will say she is as brave as lion so in simile we are not comparing directly but in metaphor we are comparing directly that she is a lion okay life is not a bed of roses heart of stone time is money the world is a stage she is a night owl so can you see these all are direct comparison but in simile we don't use direct comparison right so i hope it is clear now one thing we can see here every simile can be compressed into a metaphor and every metaphor can expand it into a simile right like thus instead of saying akash fought like a lion this is simile akash was lion in the fight so this is metaphor so try to understand this simile we used indirect comparison with two unlike things akash fought like a lion right that means his bravery is comparing with this lion but when we used to talk about metaphor it is akash was lion in the fight right akash was lion in the fight that means it is comparing directly that akash was a lion okay so that's all this simile and metaphor let's come to the next one this is personification so what is this personification in personification in animate objects and abstract notions are spoken of as having life and intelligence personification occurs when the author or speaker gives human characteristics to non human objects right so this is also a very common point we used to teach our students right so personification it gives human traits or characteristics to something that isn't human that isn't human such as animals objects or non living things right so when a writer uses personification he or she gives characteristics of a person to a an animal object or thing okay let's try to understand in this more easiest way for example see the trees is scream in the raging wind the trees a scream in the raging wind so what it is written here that can trees actually scream no because screaming it is a human behavior that is a human trait so the use of personification here gives a better description of the sound trees makes in strong winds right let's see this one personification gives human qualities to non living things or ideas or lifeless objects are spoken of as having life the flowers nodded the car died in the middle of the road is it possible that car can die no this is a human behavior so this gives human qualities to non living things that's why it is personification the thunder grumbled the wind howled okay so this is called personification now the next is apostrophe right so this is also a very common point an apostrophe is a direct address to the dead to the absent or to a personified object or idea and this figure is a special form of personification oh stars and clouds and winds we are all about to mock me if you really pity me crush sensation and memory let me begin as now but if not depart depart and leave me in the darkness 
it was by Mary Shelley by Frankenstein 1818. This is a line of apostrophe. So basically, what is apostrophe? That it is a figure of a speech in which a speaker directly addresses someone or something that is not present. Okay, which is actually not present or cannot respond in reality. As a literary device, this apostrophe it is a poetic phrase. Apostrophe it is a poetic phrase or speech which made by a character that is addressed to a subject that is not literally present in the literary work. And the subject may be dead. The subject may be absent. An inanimate object or even an abstract idea. Okay. And a literary apostrophe is designed to direct a reader or audience member's attention to the entity being addressed as a means of indicating its importance of significance. Right. And in addition, I would like to say this apostrophe is also utilized. As a way for a character to express their internal thoughts and feelings to someone or something that is not able to respond, actually, right? So this is called apostrophe. Okay. Now the next, suppose for example, if I'll say, "Come on, phone, give me a ring." Come on phone give me a ring chocolate why must you be so delicious so actually chocolate is not present it is not a human character okay it just says why must you be so delicious the subject is dead here the subject is absent here it is an inanimate object okay alarm clock please don't fail me seven you are my lucky number so these are the example of apostrophe. Okay. Once again, I'm telling you that this is a figure of a speech in which a speaker is directly addresses someone which is not present. Always remember the point that in the apostrophe, it is a speech which speaker directly addresses someone which is not present or cannot respond in reality. Chocolate can respond. Alarm clock can respond directly. No. So these are the points of apostrophe. These are the examples of apostrophe, right? Now, <clears throat> the next one, if I'll go, then this is hyperbole. You also might have heard this about figure of speech hyperbole. This is very common that it is a statement which is made emphatic by overstatement. And uh, in our daily life also, a lot of times we use the word hyper, uh, we, we are using this hyperbole. But somehow we don't know that what is this actually hyperbole. See, the, I'm telling you, this is an example which it is given here that I have told you a million times. Is it possible to say a single thing million times? Suppose in conversation also we used to say a lot of times that I have told you hundred times. So is it actually possible to tell something hundred times? No. So when we exaggerate anything, right? That point is called hyperbole. Let's see this in easiest way. Suppose here, exaggerate language used for emphasis. My shoes are killing me. Is it possible to, is it possible for shoes to kill someone? No. Actually, what does it mean? My shoes hurt very bad. Right? In simple language, hyperbole uses exaggeration for emphasis or effect. Okay. Hyperbole uses exaggeration for emphasis or effect. I have told you to stop thousand times. Is it possible to say thousand times any word or anything? No. That purse must have cost a billion dollars. It means that purse 
it might have contained some more money or you can say a uh, lot of money but not actually billion dollars i could do this forever bhim had a strength of 100 elephants bhim had a strength of 100 elephants we, we know the bhim a character bhim, bhim had a strength of 100 elephants so we know that bhim is one of the strongest person okay of pandavas but actually 100 elephants it is the exaggeration for emphasis or effect you can say in hindi we can say this is called like a bada chada kar kehna this is called exaggeration for emphasis or effect this hyperbole so basically hyperbole it uses the exaggeration or emphasis or effect right so the next is euphemism so what is this euphemism euphemism consists in the description of disagreeable thing by an agreeable name right you are telling me a fairy tale you are telling me a fairy tale that is a lie right so euphemism is actually what it is a figure of speech which commonly used to you can say to replace a word or phrase that is related to a concept which might make others uncomfortable okay it refers to figurative language designed to replace phrasing that would otherwise be considered harsh impolite or unpleasant and this literary device allows for someone to say what they mean indirectly without using literal language as a way of softening the impact of what is being said and the reason for this would be for the sake of politeness discretion and other means of uh mitigating communication and euphemism are used to certain abstractions such as death sex aging getting fired bodily functions and others let me show you one thing more say this one it is a figure of speech the substitution of an agreeable or inoffensive expression for one that may often or suggest something unpleasant right See, how's the task going? Another side conversation is I am continuing to identify inappropriate solutions. Then the other side is saying you might find yourself between jobs if you keep that up. Between jobs means unemployed, right? So, some, for example, if I'll use this euphemism for death. So how we will use this euphemism for death? There are lots of words we used to say in our daily life that passed away or departed, lost. Okay, so actually it is one of the most common abstractions to be replaced by euphemism is death. Using euphemism to express death and dying may be a way to avoid confronting mortality or to gain some emotional distance from a sad circumstance so here are the examples which i have written here that resting in peace does it what does it mean it means it shows euphemism for death met ultimate demise okay there are lots of words which we used for death like meet the maker going to a better place six feet under sleeping with the fishes eternal slumber over the rainbow bridge so these are actually used for pets and animals okay so these are the examples of euphemism for death so it is actually what i said that it is commonly used to replace a word or phrase that is related to concept which might makes others uncomfortable like uh, designed to replace phrasing that would otherwise to consider harsh implies or unpleasant thing Right. So now the next 
one is antithesis. So what is this antithesis? It's a striking opposition or contrast of words or sentiments is made in the same sentence. It is employed to secure emphasis. Right. For example, speech is silver, but silence is golden. So you can see it strikes the opposition or contrast of the words as it is written here that speech is silver, but silence is golden. Love and hate, good and evil, peace and war, opposite word, which is strike opposite word. Right. You can see this like, a, and it is a figure of speech in which the exact opposite or contrasting ideas are conveyed, like give me liberty or give me death. So in some way, liberty opposite, it comes death. Give me liberty or give me death. Okay. So this is called antithesis. Now, the next one is oxymoron. So what is this now oxymoron? It is a special form of antithesis whereby two contradictory qualities are predicted at once of the same thing. I am busy doing nothing. This is also a part of antithesis. It's not actually part. It is a, a special form of antithesis. They are also opposite and here also opposite but in two contradictory qualities. I am busy doing nothing. Once it is saying I am busy. Right. And another it is saying nothing. So this shows a part of uh, this figure of speech, this oxymoron. It examples are to known secret, orderly confusion, defeating silence, confirmed rumor. Okay, awfully nice. In simplest way, we can say this. Two contradictory terms used together or a combination of two words of opposite meaning in one sentence. Right. The boy is regularly irregular. Now see this sentence. The regularly irregular means continuously he is making absence. So once the word is regularly and the another word is irregular. Right? So this is showing oxymoron. It says oxymoron. So let's come to the another figure of speech. This is called epigram. So what is this epigram? An epigram it is a brief pointed saying frequently introducing antithetical ideas which excite surprise and arrest attention. Okay. Like mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. Just try to understand the sentence what it is saying here. Live simply so that others may simply live. Okay. What is now this epigram? In this epigram, a short and witty poems are pointed. Basically, statement often written in two well balanced part. Here we need to balance the statement. To err is human. To forgive divine. It means human beings are doing mistakes, and our God is forgiving us. Early bed, early to rise, make some man healthy, wealthy, and wise. This is a very common sentence which we used to learn from the childhood. Right. So, I can remember a sentence that uh, uh, fools rush where angels fear to tread. Fools rush where angels fear to tread. So, see how beautifully this sentence has been balanced. What does it mean? What, what is the meaning of this sentence? Fools rush where angels fear to tread. It means actually in Hindi we are saying that ki murk bhagte jahan parishte chalne se darte. So this sentence is beautifully balanced. Okay. And uh, there is some sort of witty also and often it written in balanced part. Basically we need to balance the sentence and then it is called as epigram. Right. So, next part is 
it is very common we used to in our classes of 9 11 10 12 irony even in class 8 also we used to see the poems irony poet uses lot of times irony so what is this basically irony irony is a mode of speech in which the real meaning is exactly the opposite of that which is literally conveyed for brutus is an honorable man so are they all all honorable men right can anyone tell me from where this line has been taken for brutus is an honorable man so are they all all honorable men any one of you can you say from where this line has been taken yeah sir, julius, julius caesar julius caesar thank you ma'am the line this has been taken from julius caesar okay and the quote it is spoken by mark antony and is reporting that brutus a tyrant is an honorable man so see mark antony does not agree and is saying that if brutus is an honorable man then everyone is honorable in effect he is no different than anyone else so why this line it is written like this for brutus is an honorable man so are they all all honorable men just to put some effect on the sentence so it is a literary device in which contradictory statements or situations reveal a reality that is different from what appears to be true right and uh, uh, there are many forms of irony which is featured in english literature the effectiveness of this irony as a literary device it depends on the reader's expectation and understanding of the disparity between what should happen and what actually happens in a literary work this we need to understand that what should happen and what actually happens in a literary work okay this can be in the form of unforeseen outcome of an event a character's unanticipated behavior or something incongruous that is said okay um one example like butter is as uh, butter is soft as a marble i can I, i'll show you in the next slide but before that i would like to add that one of the most famous examples of irony in literature which comes from uh from the chapter the gift of the magi by o henry okay basically i think it is in class 7 or 8 7 if i'm 7 and some of the classes it is might be in class 8 also this is story a gift of magi and in this story a newly married couple decides independently to sacrifice and sell what means most to themselves in order to purchase a christmas gift for the other for the other and unfortunately the gifts they receive from each other are intended for the very price possessions they both sold as a result you might have taught your students and as a result uh, though their sacrifices symbolizes the love they have for each other the actual gifts they receive are all but useless so in this chapter you can see lots of irony has been used right so let's try to understand in more easiest way suppose it occurs when there is a marked contrast between what is said and what is meant it means uh, you can say like a uh, double meaning words or between appearance and reality of the words like someone want to say something but it means actually something different in such a way that intent meaning is different from the actual meaning as i told you the butter is soft as a slab of marble it means the butter is actually not soft as a slab of marble it becomes very hard but it is saying the button is soft as a slab of marble another example you can see the student was given excellent on getting zero in the exam okay the student was given excellent on getting zero in the exam so 
what does it mean the student was given excellent on getting zero in the exam that means he is getting actually zero the titanic was said to be unsinkable but sank on its first voyage everyone is saying the titanic okay the titanic you all have heard about this it is a biggest ship but everyone is saying that it is it will not sink but in the first voyage only it already uh, it is a uh, sank on the first voyage so this is called situational irony right this is called situational irony so after irony the next figure of speech is pun so what is this pun it's a very common thing a pun it is the use it's a very simple one also that it is the use of the word in such a way that it is capable of more than one application the object being to produce a ludicrous effect is life worth living it depends upon the liver right so this kind of sentence is sounds is sounds some uh, comical that is life worth living that it depends upon the liver okay so basically i would like to tell you that pun it is a literary device that is also known as play on words aap kaise words ke sath khel sakte actually it what it means how you can play upon the words right and pun involves words with similar or identical sounds but with different meaning okay but with different meaning and their play on words also relies on a word or phrase having more than one meaning and it is generally intended to be humorous it is generally intended to be humorous but they often have a serious purpose as well as in literary works okay for example uh, if you were to intend a lecture about managing finances entitled common sense this feature is a pun they play on words is between sense c e n t s sense as in coins and in sense as in awareness okay lots of people are using the word coins like a cent so this pun is also effective as a play on words on the phrase common sense which is appropriate to the subject of managing finances it's basically on how you can play upon the words right so this is called <coughs> pun like suppose if i'll see uh, show you uh, why our teddy bears never hungry why are teddy bears why are teddy bears never hungry they are always stuffed you know stuffed means always they are uh, they, uh, they became never uh, hungry because they always it seems that their stomach is already means full of everything it means it is showing stuff stuffness and it means that your teddy bear they never hungry people thought that teddy bears they never hungry so it is just play upon the words that how it has been said right so this is called pun now if i will move to next figure of the speech alliteration so alliteration for me this is very easiest you can say alliteration to identify alliteration in any sort of sentence or any sort of poem okay because this alliteration it is only the repeating of consonant sound okay like uh, uh, follow followed free into the silent sea you can see the repetition of f f f is continuously repeating into the silent sea s s this is called alliteration she sells sea shells by the sea soul the repetition of word is there fair is foul and foul is fair we used to say this sentence the repetition of word is there right ship should sleep in a shed repetition of consonant sound s s as you can see everywhere it is called alliteration okay like suppose this one it is the repetition of the beginning sounds of neighboring words she sells he sells walter wonder where we knew us the repetition of the word w i saw a saw that could outsaw other saw i ever saw nick needed new notebooks everywhere you can see the word the letter n 
is repeated several times. Fred fried frog's legs on Friday. Okay. So basically, it is this kind of uh, repetitions of the beginning sounds is called alliteration. Right. Like, uh, can any one of you can give an example of alliteration which you have heard? Any any of the example? So I give it in Hindi. Yes, pardon. Can I give it in Hindi? One yeah, sure, uh, sure. alliteration, sir. Yeah, sure. Uh, the word this alliteration goes like this Chacha ne cha Chachi ko chandi ki chammat se chatni chatai. It's very exactly. easy alliteration, I always say. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Absolutely correct answer. So, this kind of sentence, like even I have also heard that uh, uh, the sentence, like one Paka ped pe, paka papita, paka pedia, paka papita, pake pedko, pakade pinko, pinko, pakade paka papita. Like this, the word is something. Okay. So, this kind of sentence, wherever you will see, you can easily justify this. Sir, may I? Sir, may I? Sir, slithering, uh, slithering snakes slither silently through the grass. Absolutely correct, ma'am. Absolutely oh. correct. Thanks. Thank you. So, these are the things. Okay. Uh, you can say tongue twister. Uh, this is uh, alliterative tongue twister, which are useful for encouraging language learners. Generally, children to hear similar sounds repeated at the beginning of several words. So this is a kind of tongue twister, you can say. A well-known alliterative tongue twister is uh, like uh, it is a bitter paper picked a peck of pickled peepers, right? So a peck of pickled peepers, bitter paper picked. This is a complete sentence. So, however. Though alliterative tongue twisters are associated with children, they are useful for practicing and improving pronunciation. As much you will repeat these words, your pronunciation will improve. Okay, your fluency will improve, your articulation will improve. And they are often utilized by actors, politicians and public speakers for verbal exercises in clarity of speaking. Okay, so this is called alliteration. Now the next figure of speech, if I'll move, this is called exclamation. Uh, there is nothing to explain, it is very simple, that in this figure of speech, the exclamatory form is used to draw greater attention to a point than a mere belt or plain statement of it could do. How sweet the moonlight on upon this bank, exclamation mark. So this exclamation mark is also this exclamation is also a part of figure of speech, right? <clears throat> the next one is interrogation. Interrogation. What it is? Interrogation. You can say uh, the rhetorical question is interrogation is the asking of question not for the sake of getting an answer but to put a point out more effectively. See, it is very clear whenever you are asking any question, if you are putting an interrogation mark, it's a, also a figure of speech. Are you crazy? Can you imagine that? What is your name? Where do you live? If you poison us, do we not die? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Means you are asking a question, but not for the sake of getting an answer. It's interrogation. Right. And uh, the last, I guess, the last one is onomatopoeia. Okay, it will pronounce onomatopoeia. Okay, and it is defined as the formation of word from a sound associated with what is named. Whenever you can see in the sentence any sort of sounds related to sound, right? Like cuckoo, sizzle, any of the sounds like natural sounds or any of the instrumental sounds, it refers to anomatopoeia. Okay. Like uh, it is defined uh, um, as a word which imitates the natural sounds of a thing. 
okay and it creates a sound effect that mimics the thing described right and making the descriptions more expressive and interesting so for instance suppose for example if i'll say the gushing stream flows in the forest which is more meaningful description than just saying the stream flows in the forest so the reader is drawn to hear the sound of gushing stream which makes the expression more effective okay so whenever you see a sound related a related sound okay any of the sound whether suppose for example ringing of the bell i'll show you the next slide p is a term of a word that sounds like what is describing whoosh splat buzz click these all are the example of onomatopoeia these all are the sounds related to sounds ringing of the bell this is also a sound right so this all 15 figure of speech i explained you i have shown you so i do hope this all it might be work when you will go to teach your students so that's all for this session right and uh, just to wind up the session i would like to wind up this session with the thoughts of swami vivekananda that it says talk to yourself at least once in a day otherwise you may miss a meeting with an excellent person in this world isn't it so i guess you understood the session so i would like to thank each and every one those who are present here thank you dr uh, you have always tell you that english language obviously it plays a very essential role in our lives because uh, whatever we speak whatever we just teach our students and everything just depends on the language only so thank you dhruv sir for this wonderful session and i hope all the participants have learned a lot thank you dhruv sir